Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namu Sadanto Suchedoye Olahi san miao san putoshi Namo sadanto suche doye Olahi san miao san putoshi Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa Bai qian wan jie nan zao yu Wo jin jian wan de shou chi yuan jie ru lai zhen shi yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, Shifu Shangren, Goe Shishong, Omito Fo, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shur, coming to you from the Gold Coast of Queensland, Australia. And we're going to be making our way through the first stage of the Ten Stages, Chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra. That's what we're about. And down here, the, my last slide on my slideshow is an invocation, which I'm going to bring up on the screen right this minute and pick up my banjo. I think it's appropriate to add some music to this request. So what we do is we Put our palms together. You're welcome to join me if you care to, and invite the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Sutra assembly to come draw near. Um, 
if you'll notice on my stream, I have a an upside down bird. <laughs> I have an inverted lorikeet. This is a lorikeet who are people love them because they're acrobatic birds. They can uh, they're very happy being upside down, very happy swinging in the wind. They're happy rotating on a on a, a carousel. They're very uh, you wonder what the center of gravity of a lorikeet is. So that this is a, a very typical lorikeet posture, totally upside down. And the bird is clinging to my internet cable at the as he is inverted here. So I do hope he uh, leaves it unscathed. But the point is not to show you what lorikeets can do. The point is to illustrate inversion, this idea of being upside down, upside down. And that's what we're about today. The as I I gave a preview of coming attractions last week, and I said we're um, in a section of text that, to my mind, is one of the most uh, profound and succinct expressions of the Buddha's wisdom uh, available. And I'll give you I'll, I'll preview it one more time and and cue you to what why I'm excited about reading this text, which is what we're doing. We're reading again. We're sutra as literature. We're going through the text one more time. We've done it fully from start to finish, but we're doing it one more time to uh, to be able to listen in English to the whole flow of the ideas and the language. So um, what this is, this is the first stage of 10 stages. It's a bodhisattva student candidate who is uh, interested in becoming a Buddha in time, but understands that the way to get to Buddhahood is to, to wake up all the living beings in his or her self nature. So that's, uh, that's the work. And that involves practices, bodhisattva practices, dharma practices. It involves vows, meaning knowing where those practices are gonna lead and setting off in that course. And, uh, um, the watchwords, what, what the Bodhisattva is aiming to use is a combination of wisdom and compassion. Those are the two things. Wisdom, define it, kind of on the kitchen tabletop. <coughs> wisdom says, I look past the surface. I see what's going on at the heart of things. Compassion says, we're all made of the same elements. There's no being beyond humans, beyond male humans or white male humans. There's no being in the world that isn't made up of same elements and who does not contain the seed of the Buddha nature itself. That's, that's the idea, wisdom and compassion. Bodhisattva says, that's what I'm gonna use. That's what I hope to uh, learn how to control, how to manage. Uh, here in the, my training academy of the 10 practices. This is my textbook. This is my uh, uh, how-to, my manual for success on the Bodhisattva path. Okay, that's, that's what it is. And today's passage just, bingo, wow, says it so well. Okay, with that as the preview, here we go. Oh, look at this, gotta make it bigger. Everybody can read it. Bigger still. Here we go. Okay. Going to read in Chinese first. So listen, listen up, everybody. Uh, see if you can uh, make sense of, of the Chinese. Uh, at least let the sounds go through your ears. These have been the... Uh, the Chinese translation of the Avatamsaka Sutra has been in people's awareness and consciousness for uh, a thousand plus years. And so these are old sounds. They vibrate in our nature. We've, even if we've never imagined being Chinese, uh, somehow these resonate deeply. They, they hit some of those the, the gongs, the, the bells, iron bells, deep within. Boom. Here we go. 
，佛子慈菩萨复作是念：诸佛正法如是深深，如是寂静，如是寂灭，如是空，如是无相，如是无怨，如是无染，如是无量，如是广大。而诸凡夫心多邪见。无名复义，立娇曼高床，入可爱网中，行产狂愁林，不能自出。心与千机相应不舍，恨啊横躁逐去受生一念，谈会于此，积积诸业日夜增长，一分。恨啊！一分，以分恨风，吹心炽火，炽然不息。翻缩作业，结颠倒相应。欲流有流，无名流见流，相继起心意识种子。Okay, there we go. We did it. We did it to that point. Ready? Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, further makes the following reflections: The Dharma of the Buddhas is as profound as this, as quiet, as still and tranquil, as empty, as free of hallmarks, as free of desire, as undefiled, as limitless, as vast and great as this. Ordinary beings, on the other hand, <laughs> allow our thoughts to go wrong. We are covered by a film of ignorance. We raise the banners of pride and arrogance. We are trapped by a net of craving, and travel the dense forest of flattery and deceit, until we can no longer extricate ourselves. Our thoughts interact with stinginess and jealousy, which we never abandon. We continually create the conditions for further rebirth. Our greed, hatred, and stupidity create karma, which increases by day and night. The winds of hatred and resentment fan the fire of mind consciousness. Whose blaze never ceases. All the karma that we create is tied to inversion. The torrents of desire, existence, ignorance, and views ceaselessly stir up the seeds of mind consciousness. Okay, we're good. This is halfway. Take a pause. <laughs> we're done. Thanks for joining. See you all next week. Oh, boy.、Uh, let me recap what we've done here. Our Bodhisattva has made vows, has expressed faith. Remember, we talked about faith two weeks ago, and then comes up with a conclusion. He says, "My, my goodness, the Dharma of the Buddhas, the teaching of the Buddha, is profound. It's deep. It's deep. It's quiet. It's serene. It's empty. There's nothing to grab onto." There's no hallmarks to it. It's not heavy. It's not weighty. There's no desire in it. It's just as it is, full and complete. There's no defilement. There's no anger. There's no killing. There's no bloodshed. It's limitless, vast, and great. So, isn't that nice? <laughs> Bodhisattva is praising the Buddha Dharma, and it comes from his heart.、Uh, I pause here. There's、uh, something. Wonderful ahead for people who like Chan meditation and the the whole、uh, cultural surrounding of Chan. That mountains, simplicity, the self sufficiency, the do it yourself nature, the integration with the elements, wind and water, right. Everybody who loves that flavor of Chan has a treat coming up, because our friend、uh, Ted Berger, Edward Ted Berger, has、uh, reissued and has renovated.、Uh, what do you say? Has、uh, edited and, and improved his one of his earlier films called Amongst White Clouds. Reissued it as、uh, The Mountain Path. The mountain path. It's not available yet, but it's coming soon. And ah, what a wonderful film!、Uh, the story goes that Ted read Bill Porter. People know Red Pine,、uh, 
uh, the uh, fearless, tireless traveler in China in the mountains, Red Pine went out to look for hermits. And uh, what was the name of, Red, of Bill's book? Um, Road to Heaven. It's called Road to Heaven. And in Road to Heaven, published 20 plus years ago, he went out and interviewed Chinese Buddhist hermits living in the mountains and found them. They were there. So I uh, wrote the book. Well, Ted, the filmmaker, read the book, was inspired, said, me too, went out and found him. But Ted carried a movie camera, and he's a skilled filmmaker. He recorded his encounters with seven different hermits, men, women, um, pretty much all, well, some young, some very young, in fact. Uh, and the camera records those conversations. And uh, Ted, we've, uh, at the Berkeley Monastery, have sponsored his films for, for some time. And his films are always modest. They're uh, simple. They're interested in the Dharma, getting to the heart of men and women who want to see past the surface of the world and themselves. So he does it. And the reason why I'm telling the story is uh, you'll be hearing more about this film as, as the time goes on. But there is one interview uh, in there. Ted goes to Zhongnan, Shan, Zhongnan Mountain. The, it's a mountain range. It's not a mountain. It finds the hermits. And there's a, there are two. There's a couple who are middle-aged Chinese men, Buddhist monks, who... Uh, rely on themselves to live the bitter, ascetic, reclusive life of a mountain hermit. And one of the guys has uh, needs to, needed to see a dentist when he was younger. He's got bad teeth. Uh, but he, the guy, uh, both of the, the two men look like they've been chewed up and spit out. They, they look rugged. They look like survivors. They look like pine trees, you know. <laughs> No storm can blow them over, but they're reduced down to the, ess the essence. There's nothing extra in their lives. And yet they are uh, sages, you know, they're profound. And the thing that I'm telling the story is the, the gentleman who uh, sitting in the back looks like he doesn't talk much. He goes into his, when he discovers what Ted Berger is about, he's really a seeker of the way, seeker of the Dharma. He goes into their, their hut, picks up a piece of charcoal, and scrawls out a poem. Uh, black charcoal on, a, on, a, <laughs> on the backside of an envelope. Or maybe it's a menu from some restaurant down in, in uh, uh, Xi'an or something. So he then explains the, the poem to, to Ted. It's his gift. And he says, he says, the teachings of the Buddha are so quiet, he says. They're so still. And then there's silence around it. And immediately I thought, bingo. Disciples of the Buddha, these bodhisattvas further make the following reflections. The Dharma of the Buddha is as profound as this, as quiet, as still, as tranquil. Now, did this mountain hermit read the Avatamsaka? Maybe, maybe he did, but he's speaking from his heart. And you can tell these, these men have no duplicity about them. They're just reflecting in words the state of their practice in response to Ted's question. He says, the Buddha's teachings are so quiet. They're so still. He says, uh, there we go. Indeed, it, it is so. And the thing is, though, that in the world of sense stimulation uh, in where if you subscribe now to Apple Music, you have a choice of 51 million songs, I believe. And well, I wanna, my goal is to listen to every one of them before I die. 50, what are you going to do with 51 million songs? I mean, that's remarkable for Apple that their, their catalog includes all of that. And Spotify, the same. Pandora the same and and uh, Amazon Music the same you know 
we we live in a world of endless bottomless stimulation and it's instant too and the, the key to it is of course this this device that if we have that device we are we are lost in an, the craziness that comes from too much choice and so here are these men who go out into the mountains where there's nothing to get water they have to take a pole put a bucket on it put another bucket to balance it go down the mountain you know, walk and walk fill their buckets turn around come back up the mountain carrying the poles and if they don't do that there's no water because this is this is what they choose they want to live in the mountains communing with nature and their minds taking all the extra off it and it, in a situation like that the buddha dharma comes alive the buddha dharma is you hear it deep within your mind whereas when you hear these truths and then you have 51 million songs to choose from the truths of the dharma somehow seem flavorless they seem like cabbage boiled in water without salt it's just not much flavor you know although i will say uh if you <laughs> taste cabbage boiled cabbage incredible flavor flavor of cabbage and same with broccoli the same with with uh, cauliflower carrots spinach it's when we depend upon all the seasoning that simple vegetables seem to be flavorless right once you strip away the stimulation the dharma shouts at you from the mountains there's nowhere that it's not right okay so you get the point now what else happens here and i want to say what have we got we have a religious text this is a spiritual classic isn't it the avatamsaka sutra supposed to be one of those scriptures and scriptures what do we expect from your, what do you want from your scripture as advertising would have it this is what we expect from our scripture uh what do we expect truth hmm? we expect stories of of the sublime the, the holy the the profound the supreme don't we don't you want to hear all the all the uh the good things about about what's waiting for us what do we get in the avatamsaka sutra we get affliction and what are called xie jin wrong views ordinary beings let their thoughts go wrong they're covered by a film of ignorance Can you imagine being covered by a film of ignorance uh-huh yeah what happens when we're covered with a film of ignorance we can't can't experience we can't taste we can't touch everything goes flat nothing tastes good nothing sounds right we open the refrigerator and close it again and yet we're hungry and yet we open it again and eh, close it again nothing looks right we have a choice of six kinds of soft drinks and and bottled beverages and cans of beverages and people have alcoholic beverages you depending on what your flavor is you got a choice between rum and gin and vodka and tequila and whiskey and brandy and a, you know and you close it because you don't want to leave sobriety and that's a film of ignorance right nothing hits the spot and yet we're hungry oh what's that called cool suffering that's bitter right they raise the banner of pride and arrogance me 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 oh my goodness pride and arrogance is like a flag going up the pole okay these are yeah this is us so my point is what how amazing that the avatamsaka sutra reads like uh um a case book from a psychotherapist this is like freud's uh notes after a day or a week or a month of psychoanalysis he says ak in himmel ai oi these living beings they are covered with the film of ignorance you know it is the banner of pride and arrogance right they're trapped by a net of craving a net of craving craving traps us we 
we're stuck with the desire. And boy, oh boy, that, that message is death to the marketplace. Why don't more people talk like this? Because it makes no money for anybody. If we say just our desire, our desire traps us. We get it and then we don't want it. Buyer is remorse. Ah, the marketplace hears this and says, ah, let's see, play, turn the music up a little bit, pal. Yeah, we, we uh, put a, a little fragrance in the hallways of the mega mall. So as you walk down the, uh, the hallways, you, you smell this sweet fragrance. That, number one, it masks the sweat and the desperation and the grief, the greed, but then it also triggers that sense of, where's that? Mm, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, marketing applies not only to our eyes and our ears and our skin, but also to our nose and our mind. Oh my goodness. Just to get us to buy something that doesn't solve the craving. It doesn't satisfy. Oh. So there we are. That's called what? Living beings. That's us. We travel the dense forest of flattery and deceit. Um, I've been in a dense forest, and there's a little bit of anxiety that maybe you might not make it out. And there's a little bit of your eyes are looking, did I turn left up ahead or sh let's see, is that familiar? I've seen that tree before. Am I going in a circle? Dense forest. And you hear sounds above you and you hear sounds behind you and you, right? And what is that? Flattery and deceit. Telling people things to manipulate them so that they can't find the truth of your relationship. That you might be after something. It sounds sweet. We go for it. Oh, and then somebody tells us the truth to our face. We don't like that. So we get lost reacting against the truth. Uh, so the saying goes, what? Hao yao ku ko are li yu bing. Good medicine. Bitter to the tongue, but it helps you recover. Yeah, so the dense forest of flattery and deceit, so we can't get out anymore. We don't know who's our real friend. Oh my goodness. And nobody says we should hang out with the people who tell you the truth, as hard as it is to hear. That's not popular, right? So we go on to Instagram and be dissatisfied with our lives. We don't look so successful. What is Instagram? Successes. Nobody posts their failures on Instagram, right? So, yeah. Our thoughts interact with stinginess and jealousy, which we never abandon. What a lot of pain. This is called wrong views. This is why the Bodhisattva is like, <laughs> take a look at living being. I'm looking in the mirror right now. These are, this is me. This is my reflection. Ignorance, arrogance, craving, deceit, uh, stinginess, jealousy, and constantly create the conditions for further rebirth. There's, there's some, when, when they say that the Avatamsaka Sutra is Buddhist philosophy, mm, that's because we don't have a word for the Dharma. What, what it is, the Buddha is not getting any benefit by showing us how much we hurt. He is a doctor. This is a doctor's view of how we are making ourselves sick. This is what he's doing. He's saying, yep, you do this and you do this. The result is what? You come back. You come back in a form that's going to die. It's going to get old, it's going to get sick, it's going to die, and it's going to be reborn. Would you like to leave that cycle? You can, right? So it's like, when I say this section of text is, it's so much truth. It's almost like, thank you. Uh, can we take a little break now? <laughs> I don't think I want to hear the Buddha's vision of how messed up I am, how inverted I am. Buddha relentlessly, Alvatam gives us 10 of everything, right? Our greed, our hatred, and our stupidity push our bodies, our mouths, and our minds into karmic behavior, which increases by day and by night. This was one of those um, uh, 
phrases. The, um, the benefit of having a teacher like Master Shrinhua, uh, who was thoroughly, thoroughly trained in the Tiantai teachings, uh, Shifu came up through monasteries in China and then uh, joined the monastic community in Hong Kong for a decade and then the, monast the monasteries of Northern California, Southern California, Oregon, Washington, Canada, and then Hong Kong, Malaysia, Taiwan, Singapore, you know. So everywhere uh, Master Hua went, he was surrounded by the traditional, there, there's kind of a hard to find a name from called like received teachings. The, the, the gossip, the scuttlebutt, the um, customary sayings that flow where people investigate the Dharma. And he would reflect those to us along with Sutra Dharma. Okay, so what's in the sutras? Yeah, we heard that. We heard the Buddha's voice. But we also heard the the way, I guess you call it the living commentary. There you go, the living commentary. And one of those living commentary was, what do we do? We qi huo, zao ye, shou guo bao. Qi huo, zao ye, shou guo bao. We create our delusions. We in we do karmic deeds, and then we get the retribution. Out of delusion, we act, and then get the bad news. That's what we do. Three steps. First comes delusion, second comes karma, third comes karma's rewards, which are usually something we don't want. So that's a living being, and that's how, you know, in the monastery, you'd hear those kind of things like, yeah, these formulas. What we call these? We call these decoding the Dharma. These are the nuggets of Dharma. In those three um, steps is compressed the misery of the world. Deluded. What does it mean to be deluded? It means the winds of hatred and resentment fan the fire of mind consciousness which never blaze, never ceases. Hatred and resentment. Just, we hate people. Uh, Snezhana Akpinar, our beloved retired chancellor from Dharma Rum Buddhist University, um, was raised in, uh, she's Croatian, but she was raised in Italy by uh, her, her parents. Her dad was a university professor at the University of Zagreb for many decades and uh, they traveled all over um, Eastern Europe and Western Europe so she she grew up uh, learning 11 languages <laughs> reading that many and uh, the house that she lived in in uh, the island of Split off the coast of Croatia uh, used to be, she lived in a house that was originally a Carmelite, I believe, convent from the 14th century. So, you know, living in a house that was first put on those foundations how many hundreds of years ago? 600 years ago. And she would talk about the between that she would uh, insert herself into the the uh, gossip in the neighborhood there in on the island of Split, uh, and she said that the enmities, the hatred, and the vengeance created back in the 15th century has never been extinguished. It's never been ended. People are still fighting over wrongs and slights done by a clan, by a family that had been living next door or upstairs four or 500 years later. Um, the U.S. hasn't even been a country that long, nor has Australia, uh, a colonized country. And the, uh, where I grew up in Ohio, the jokes was down in the mountains of southern Ohio, West Virginia, the Hatfields and the Coys. 
the Hatfields and the Coys had the had this vengeance, and it was a blood feud. And you saw one of the uncles or the cousins or the nephews or the brothers, and you shot at them. <laughs> that to see him was to to want to kill him. And each killing sparks another round of hatred. You got another grievance. So yeah, people are. What do we do? The winds of hatred and resentment fan the fire of mind consciousness, whose blaze never ceases. Here's the Buddha talking about the Hatfields and the Coys. He's talking about the uh, or McCoys, Hatfield and McCoys, real feud, and talking about, you know, the island of Split, where you double America's only been here for 300 some years, and in Split, that's half of the lifetime of a feud among the Croatians there and the Italians. So all the karma they create is tied to inversion. So every part of this is upside down. Upside down. Hallelujah. Okay, I got a, uh, uh, I got an upside down song for you. The song of living beings. Okay, and what is it? Uh, there's my upside down bird. So the song is called uh, Long Black Veil. I'll sing it now so we can stop listening to my t speaking voice. does it go? It has to do with a man who seeking pleasure because it felt good uh, had an affair with his best friend's wife. As uh, he says, 10 years ago on a cold dark night Someone was killed beneath the town hall light. The people who saw it, they all agreed that the slayer who ran looked a lot like me. Oops. The judge said, son, what is your alibi? If you were somewhere else, you don't have to die. But I spoke not a word, though it meant my life. For I'd been in the arms of my best friend's wife. She walks these hills in a long black veil, visits my grave when the night winds wail. Nobody knows, nobody sees, nobody knows but me. The scaffold is high as eternity nears. She stands in the crowd, but sheds not a tear. Sometimes at night, when the cold wind moans, in a long black veil, she cries o'er my bones. <laughs> so if you want to hear the truth about living beings suffering and our inversion, go to the music. That's It's caught up in a few short words. And you can sing it too. And, and ideally, these songs would be uh, lessons to us, right? Wouldn't these be, uh, you know, cautionary tales that would say, well, next time, if you find out how much suffering is involved, don't do it. No, nope. we jump right in, two feet, both feet. So the couple, because that feeling came over us, that had that feeling, so you decided to go ahead and, and uh, fall in love with each other. Never mind that this, you're going to break up the relationship of your best friend and his wife. That's okay because, well, it felt, it was fate, right? And then what else? So you, somebody gets killed and you know you did it and all you have to do is say that it wasn't you and you're free. But you can't say where you were because that would reveal the fact that you were in an adulterous relationship with your best friend and his wife. So you get hanged and you die and she cries over your bones. Everybody happy. <laughs> State of living beings. Ten years ago, 
on a cold, dark night. Someone was killed beneath the town hall line. The people who saw, they all agreed that the slayer who ran looked a lot like me. The judge said, son, what is your alibi if you were somewhere else? You don't have to die. I spoke not a word, though it meant my life, cause I'd been in the arms of my best friend's wife. She walks these hills in a long black veil, as it's my grave. When the night winds wail Nobody knows Nobody sees Nobody knows But me The scaffold is high Eternity nears Where she stands in the crowd she sheds not a tear sometimes at night when the cold winds moan in a long black veil she cries o'er my bones she walks these hills in a long black veil sees nobody knows but me now tell me it was worth it to uh, give in to that feeling felt good <sighs> yeah briefly briefly what is the nature of pleasure it's brief Joni Mitchell, who said, pleasure moves on too early, trouble leaves too slow. But at the time, we just can't remember that. That's why it's called inverted, upside down. Okay, more, more sutra. Buddha, those, that long black veil and those crying moans over my cold bones in my grave. Is there a way out? Out. Is there a way out? Yu san jie tian zhong fu sheng ku ya. So wei ming si gong sheng bu li. Ci ming si zeng chang. Sheng liu chu ju lo. Yu zhong xiang dui sheng chu chu. Chu gu sheng ai. Ah, sorry. Chu gu, ah, chu gu sheng shou, in shou sheng ai. Ai zeng zhang, gu sheng qu, qu zeng zhang, gu sheng you, you sheng gu, you sheng lao si, you bei ku nao, gu shi zhong sheng, sheng zhang ku qu. Shi zhong jie kong, li wo, wo so, wu zhi, wu jue, wu zuo, wu shou, wu cao, mu, shi, bi. Yiru ying xiang, ran zhu zhong sheng, bu jue, bu zhi. Ready? Here's truth. Within the fields of the three realms, the sprouts of suffering constantly grow. That is, name and form grow together inseparably. Because name and form increase, the assembly of the six senses arises. Because of contact, Feeling arises. Because of feeling, love arises. Love increases, therefore grasping arises. Grasping increases, 
therefore existence arises. Because existence arises, birth, old age, death, anxiety, sorrow, suffering, and vexation come to exist. Thus, living beings bring about a mass of suffering. Yet, they remain unaware that within it, all is empty, free of self, and what belongs to self, devoid of knowing and awareness, with no doer and no receiver, like grass and wood, like rocks and walls, and also like reflections. Still, living beings are unaware and do not know. Thank you, Buddha. What we just heard is um, what my sainted uh, professor, Professor Nakasone, said, probably from his point of view, may be the Buddha's number one contribution to, uh, to the collective wisdom of mankind, of humanity, which is called the 12 links of conditioned arising, conditioned co-production. And what this is, is there's a, a, a necessary precondition. You have to be quiet. You have to be still in your mind so that you can see this process happening. The Buddha saw this in his mind, in his samadhi, in his state of stillness. He said, yep, that's going on. My goodness. It's like an assembly line. It starts out under the cover of ignorance and it leads to what? Old age, sickness, death, and grief and suffering. It's called the 12 links of conditioned co-production. He says, it's happening right this minute, right this. Snap your fingers, everybody. There, it's happening now to us in the instant that I'm speaking, you're listening. This is going on inside us and it creates all the trouble. This is the Buddha's creation story. How powerful. It's not in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and God looked upon the waters and he said, create the planet and human, not. It's a different story. It's a different story. It's not in a distant supreme being. It's in me right this minute. And the Buddha said, here's how it works. You want to see how it works? Here's how it works. I'll tell you. Now, I did a... Mind you, we're listening to the language this time, aren't we? We're, we're not explaining. Yes, we are explaining. We're not explaining. Yes, we are explaining. So, sorry for that confusion. But this is so good. It's so good. It's in English. We can benefit by running through one more time. Here it is. The suffering that we experience comes from a process, a mechanism that karma action creates. The appearance of a self creates a cause which results in a result in a which then in turn creates, spell that out, creates uh, creators, creates results and links to the next appearance and so forth. So there's the process. And the Buddha said, see the whole process. Watch what's happening. It's not a simple, it's not, oh, fate did it. Chance did it. God did it. No. The Buddha says, we are doing it because this is how the, the universe builds things. We are lifting the hood on the engine of the universe. Take a look. Ignorance, ignorance is, I don't know. The judge said, son, what is your alibi? Why did you fall in love with your best friend's wife? I don't know. I did it. It led to actions. And the ignorance just brought into being, because you didn't know, but you felt something rising. So you, your eyes caught her eyes, or her, her eyes caught your eyes. His eyes caught his eyes, her eyes caught her eyes. It tugged into action, and with the action, consciousness was born, because there was movement out of stillness, out of perfection. Consciousness then taps name and form. Uh-huh, this me and you. 
There's two now. There's duality. There's multiple. Before it was one unity. Now it's multiple. Name and form. Oh, mm -hmm. feel that touch, smell that scent, hear that sound. The six senses arise. Six senses make contact. Contact is pleasant, unpleasant. Ooh, that feels really... I want to feel more of that. I want more, a bigger piece of chocolate cake, more ice cream. I want a cooler drink, right? Sensation. Sensation awakes something in us that just has a life of its own. I want a lot of that. I want more of it. Do it again, right? Stirring, crazy grasping. I don't want to stop. Cling to that. Grasping, now it exists. And being, because it exists, it's going to die. Old age, sickness, and death, and suffering. The Buddha said, that's the process. And please witness it because you are the creator of everything around you and your reactions to it. Self and others, rights and wrongs, true and false, all happens in this process covered by the darkness of film of ignorance. And yet, now this is key, this is what's so cool. The Buddha then says, even though we do this, take a look. He says, yet those beings, we remain unaware that within this entire theater, this entire show, there's nothing going on but the process. There is no self until you build it. And there's no others. There's no me, mine. There's no knowing. There's no awareness. It's just a process. It's a series of, you could say, chemical reactions. It's very scientific. Devoid of knowing, devoid of awareness, no doer and no receiver until you set it in motion. What do we like? It's really like grass and wood. We're like rocks. We're like walls. We're like reflections. Sun hits water. And yet, living beings are unaware. And we don't know what's going on. And in the midst of this, play, we're on stage thinking it's all real. Amazing. Yay, Buddha. Now, we're not done. We're not done. There's a little bit more because this is the key. This is the, the concluding sentence for today's powerful text. What does he say? Pusa jian zhu zhong sheng yu ru shi ku ju Buddha Chu Li Shi Gu Ji Sheng Da Bei Chi Hui Fu Zuo Shi Nian Si Zhu Zhong Sheng Wo Ying Jiu Ba Zhi Yu Jiu Jing An Le Zhi Chu Shi Gu Ji Sheng Da Ci Guang Ming Zhi The Bodhisattva sees all living beings suffering such misery that they cannot escape and in his heart greatly compassionate wisdom arises he reflects in this way, I should rescue and save all these living beings and set them in the place of ultimate peace and joy. For this reason, he immediately brings forth the radiant wisdom of great kindness. This is where kindness and compassion come from, and it's where compassion and, and wisdom interact. This, uh, of the whole... Ten stages. This is stage one. If we had to say, why doesn't a bodhisattva just leave? They could. Bodhisattvas could take themselves out of it and get free, liberated from suffering. But they see what we're doing to ourselves. They see this misery, and as a typo, we can't escape. We scratch the get. That shouldn't have a get there. And compassionate wisdom arises in the Bodhisattva's heart. He says, there's nothing there except these mechanisms, these processes of one thing tugging something else into being. The suffering wouldn't arise if you, we went back through the 12 links. The suffering wouldn't arrive if birth didn't happen. And birth wouldn't happen if existence didn't happen. And existence wouldn't happen if there wasn't clinging. 
And clinging wouldn't happen if there wasn't thirst. And thirst wouldn't happen if there wasn't contact. And contact wouldn't happen if it wasn't, you know. So that kind of clear, wise insight is so powerful because the Buddha said, I don't care if you believe in it or not, I've seen this process happening. It is really happening just like that. And it always is when the conditions come together, one tugs the next one. Who makes it? Nature, the nature. You can stop the tugging. There are places in this series of links, this chain of ties, where you can just say, I'm not going to move with the feeling. So our hero who's arrested, charged by the judge to come up with a story, refuses to, to save his, his, his lover, right? He isn't going to tell the truth because he can save her life. He's already killed her husband. And so he goes to the gallows. He's hung. He's buried. He's suffering. She's suffering alone now. All of that misery could have been avoided. There was choice. There was a turning point when, as those feelings rose, where? Because of contact. Because of contact, feeling arises. Because of feeling, love arises. Right there. You could have said, you know what? She's a married woman. I don't want to break the law. Coveting someone else's spouse, the Ten Commandments says, sin. Uh, sexual misconduct, the Buddha Dharma says, offense. You'll suffer. Right? That affliction will result because you've harmed your nature and the nature of the person you're with. So, at that point, you can stop it and go, ah, right and wrong. I know right and wrong. That's wrong. Don't do it. But desire overrides. And also the wind of karma is in there as well. So if we've done it before, if it's happened to us, so we do it again, it's, that's where the vengeance and the recriminations arise. Right? So, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Here's our story. This is launched. How many newspaper headlines throughout all time? This is it right here. This is the story. This is like the news of living beings is right here in this section of text. Omi Tofu. Still living beings are unaware and don't know that fundamentally there's nothing going on. So here's, this is a, I love this uh, explanation uh, Master Chung Guan, our Tang Dynasty commentator, said, we need, uh, here it is here, he says, there are three contemplations that you need to know. That is to say, our school of consciousness only says, Zhen Ben, uh, Zhen Le Ben Yo, true happiness, we have it. We already have it. True happiness, fundamentally, we possess it, but we go out and lose it, and we don't even know that we've lost it. Wang Ku Ban Kong, false suffering is at its root empty. And yet we feel suffering and we don't know. We experience suffering, we don't recognize its nature. So we already possess true happiness. We lose it and we don't know where it went. We throw it away. We let it go out our six senses. The false suffering that we experience is empty fundamentally. But when we experience suffering, we don't recognize its nature, that there's nothing there. And yet this, the pain is real, is real. Ah, oh, my goodness. Ordinary beings, what do we do? We let our thoughts go wrong. Wrong views, covered with ignorance, banner of arrogance, net of craving, forest of deceit, can't get out, stinginess and jealousy, we never let it go, we never want to give to somebody else, create the conditions for future rebirth, and greed, 
hatred and delusion create karma which grows by day and night. Mind consciousness, fire burns us. The karma is upside down. So these four torrents, we didn't even talk about the four torrents. There's a whole lecture on the torrents, these floods, raging floods of desire, existence, ignorance, and views stir up the seeds of consciousness. At that point, the 12 links turn, can't stop them. Within the fields of the three realms, the sprouts of suffering grow. Name and form, all through the six. Bodhisattva sees this and says, oh man, they can't get out. They cannot escape. And in his heart, greatly compassionate wisdom arises. He reflects, I should rescue and save these living beings, set them in the place of ultimate peace and joy. And with that in mind, radiant wisdom of great kindness arises. Thank you, Buddha Dharma. What do you think? That, that's a lot, right? That was like, <laughs> So, um, Okay, you, Ben, you sent that to messages, right? That picture? Okay, I'm going to go into messages. And let's take a look here. Got it right here. Uh, everybody, hold on. What have we got here? Uh, let me bring it, I'm going to bring it down to my desktop. Okay. Uh, what do we have here? This is a python vanishing underneath our kitchen. Vanishing under our, our old kitchen, our old dining room. Okay, so that's, it's a beautiful python. And uh, I am now in a place to be able to appreciate pythons. Uh, I have another python. There we go. Here's a python. This is uh, Serafina who lives over on here on our property, an elderly uh, female carpet python. Look at the intelligence in her. The planet Earth is in her eyeballs, right? So here's a, this is a python. If people are freaking out, I apologize. Not everybody's ready to look at carpet snakes, uh, especially if you live in a city, you can't imagine. So that was this, this critter, this animal, they're animals. Uh, it has is not venomous. Beautiful. This was probably how long was this snake been? That was about a, a, a third of it. Sticking out. What? what how, how how long was he? Close to two meters. Two meters. Okay. So two meter snake. And here, uh, in Australia, pythons are considered uh, friends because they rid the house of. Uh, of rodents and such things. Um, our local snake catcher tells us that uh, uh, one in every three houses in Queensland has a python in the roof. They're that common. They're nocturnal, so you don't know it. And they live up above on the rafters, and they come out at night. And, and uh, if you have mice or bush rats, they take care of that. Um, anyway, so we, on our way to today's lecture here, uh, met uh, a group of friends who were very excited. There were some young people, their kids. And they had a python. And to see a python in midday uh, out where people are is kind of unusual. And there's something happening here at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm, which is a, a stupa, a baota, has arrived. Created in Taiwan. We've been waiting for it for months and months. And it's about to be installed. This time next week, we will have pictures of the Chua Pagoda and uh, the stupa, not a pagoda. And I'll tell you some stories about stupas next time. But we thought how interesting that the python showed up to greet the stupa. Same time the stupa was opened and we saw what was in there, our the python here to greet us. So we thought that was kind of uh, maybe auspicious. And I wanted to share a story um, from my my personal experience about stupas and snakes. People know that in the uh, among the Tianlong Babu, the gods and the dragons and the Eightfold Pantheon, 
one of them is called uh, uh, a the uh, Mohal Wachi. It's called the Mahoraga, and a Maho, Mahoraga. Some people pronounce it probably not Raga, Mahoraga, Mahoraga. It is a Damangsha. It's called. It's a it's a python or a boa. Some people translate, and it's uh, it is definitely a snake. It's not a dragon. And snakes and dragons need to be differentiated. Dragons don't like to be called snakes, apparently. And this was a, it's a, a very large snake that the Buddha encountered in his travels. And the snake was so big that everybody was afraid of it. But the Buddha, as people know, um, when he was a baby, nine snakes, uh, spread their hoods to shelter the baby Buddha. And dragons came and bathed him with sweet dew and such. But snakes have been, uh, in India certainly, are very much a part of the landscape. And they recognized the future uh, world honored one and, and came to set up a relationship with him and protect him so that they could hear the Dharma and get liberated from their animals' bodies. That's uh, how the story goes. So, we talk about the gods and the dragons in the Eightfold Pantheon. Well, the, uh, the great Mangsha, the great snake, uh, is one of them. Okay, so that's the background. I had an opportunity in 1989 to travel to Xi'an, to go out to western Shanxi province, and look at, we were on the trail of the we were heading out to Taishan, to Five Peaks Mountain, one of the four great holy mountains. We stopped at Xi'an along the way because that's kind of the jumping off point for the Silk Route. It's the eastern end of the Silk Route as well. It used to be called Chang'an. Uh, the terracotta soldiers, people have seen those. They're uh, not far from Xi'an. But Xi'an was uh, the uh, largest city close to Zhongnanshan, the Zhongnan Mountains. I referred to them earlier in today's lecture, uh, talking about um, the uh, the hermit who talked about how still and quiet and tranquil and serene the Buddha Dharma was, how deep. So we had an opportunity, myself and and uh, three other monks, to visit uh, the Zhongnan Mountains, and our grand teacher, Master Empty Cloud. Uh, lived as a hermit on the Zhongnan Mountains. Many of his stories in his 120-year-old, 120-year lifespan focused on the Zhongnan Mountains. And the Zhongnan Shan is not a mountain, it's a mountain range. It's from, uh, from space, it's about 60, you see it's about 60 kilometers with all the different mountains, peaks in it. And it has been a place where hermits love to live for centuries. There are uh, leopards there. The Chinese, they're called the bao. They're, they're leopards. There are, of course, many snakes. Uh, I don't know if there are uh, what other kinds of uh, mammal predators there are. But uh, lots of monkeys and, uh, of course, wild, incredible wildlife. Um, to live there, you have to be rugged. You have to be tough. But uh, as I mentioned, it's precisely why hermits, pilgrims, uh, ascetics love the Zhongnan Mountains as the place to cultivate because there's spiritual energy there and you can truly uh, pare down all the extras and focus in on the nature and see what you can do with that covering, that film of ignorance, right? So one of the most famous monks in Chinese in the Chinese Sangha was a monk called Dao Shen, Dao Shen Lu Shi. Dao Shen was the one who put the, the, the teachings on the precepts together, the Vinaya. And Dao Shen Lu Shi built a monastery called Jing Ye Si, Pure Karma Monastery. Pure Karma. And over the years, especially in the Cultural Revolution, uh, Pure Karma Monastery uh, fell into re disrepair, fell into ruin. And the Red Guards swarmed over it, destroyed it. And bit by bit, people uh, occasionally, since 
Cultural Revolution ended, people would go out to Jingye Si and uh, try to make a go of it. And there was one monk who became the abbot, the Buddhist association named him the abbot of Jingye Si. And he, uh, along with cultivating the way, he augmented his uh, meager resources by collecting medicinal herbs in the mountains. And because the, it's just, you know, it's, it is natural and the nature there is very fertile and abundant. So just the several months, just months before we arrived, uh, guiding by an elder, Mr. Bai, who was the kind of the Buddhist association uh, guest prefect. He, uh, he, when we came out, these monks from America, he greeted us and took us into Zhongnanshan. Months before we arrived, the abbot of Jingye Si, Shir Karma Monastery, had been murdered by bandits who were out to steal the bark off the trees and sell it. He tried to defend the trees and they killed him. Big news, big scandal in the Buddhist community of Xi'an. So the Buddhist Association had, in order to staff Jing Ye Si, had gone out to Shaolin Monastery. They said, oh, bandits operating in the Zhongnan Mountains, we better get some people who can defend themselves. So they wrote to, uh, to Henan, to Dengfeng, to Shaolin Monastery. And Shaolin Monastery responded by sending half a dozen young monks they were trained in martial arts, but they had decided to walk the path of the, to becoming Fa Sung Dharma monks, not Wu Sung martial monks, but they had still been trained in martial arts. So when we arrived at Jing Ye Si, here were these six young, in their 20s, young monks who'd been ordained just a few years, but they were available and they were ready to defend Jing Ye Si from any kind of, of uh, nonsense going on with robbers stealing the herbs and, you know, trying to make, make a profit off the monastery's grounds. So we got there. And uh, the, uh, the, the monk who was in charge of the group of six had been on the path of a martial career as a martial bhikshu, but he injured himself. He received an injury through his martial arts. And so he had to recover and he spoke excellent English with a British accent. And we said, how do you speak such English? He said, I listen to the BBC. <laughs> I have a shortwave radio. I listen to the BBC and they have an English class. So whoa, you learned, you learned English over the, you know, your shortwave radio, pretty good. He spoke English and they were so poor that in order to offer us hospitality, they took leaves that fell off the trees, just whatever they could find, put it in hot water and served it to us. And it was, of course, delicious because we were, had been climbing over these boulders to get to, it's rugged. The path is, the mountain pass in Zhongnanshan is rugged indeed. So we we're drinking our tea and the uh, young monk says, well, uh, let's tell, we'll tell you something about this place. He said, we, uh, followed a trail up the mountains and we found very steep we found a cave and in the cave was a stone block a stele s-t-e-l-e a stele uh, a stone inscription that somehow the red guards didn't find and it was written by Bai Jui the famous uh Bo Jui, Bai Jui, the Tang Dynasty poet, who was the famous Buddhist poet here in this area. He came to Jing Ye Si to follow Master Dao Shen, and he left behind poem. It was carved into the stone. Here it was. And it talked about a snake, a mangsha, that came to the monks, to Dao Shen at Jing Ye Si, and the snake was so big. Nobody had ever seen a snake that big. And the snake communicated through its mind. It talked to them, not in words, but through its mind. And 
it let them know that as long as they were cultivating the way, they were safe. He was going to protect the place. So that was written on the steely. We found that. And we thought, wow, that's amazing. We left it there. We didn't bring it down. We were afraid that somebody would find it. So we left it in the cave. You want to see it? <laughs> it's like, yes, we want to see it. So we followed them up the trail and walked up, you know, steep, really steep, just kind of pulling. They, they were, didn't know if these soft monks from America would make it. But well, we told them that we were three steps, one bow, and they, they had heard about three steps, one bow, and city of 10,000 Buddhas. So they said, oh, maybe you can make it. So we pulled our way up to the cave. Sure enough, there was this stele uh, with Baiju Yi, you know, and uh, they, we didn't take pictures of it because it was, they asked us not to. So we came back down, and we're having a second cup of tea, and he said, oh, and by the way, he said, the snake showed up the first week after we arrived. We said, what snake? He said, the snake. It came to us. We were, we were in the courtyard sweeping. And somebody said, uh, sure, we'll look. And I looked and I turned around and here was the biggest snake. He said his body was as big around as my chest. And it was sitting there looking at me at eye level, unmoving, just calmly checking me out. He said it was looking at me. And I and immediately instructed all of our monks who were working there to set our brooms down and face the Buddha, the Buddha image, and bow and indicate that we were there not to steal, not to cause trouble. We were there to protect Ching Yesu. And he said the monk nodded and then went down and snaked away. He said, yeah, we all saw it. <laughs> so we're like, oh. Yeah. Uh, so the Tang Dynasty and the Buddha's time and the 20th century all merged into a timeless story of people, uh, humans covered by the film of ignorance, not being able to hear in ourselves what Master Cheng Guan, our Tang Dynasty commentator, said is that this happiness that arise that arises from being complete and full is inside us right now we've got it we don't lack it a bit but we lose it and we don't even know when we throw it away with both hands we throw it away pursuing mostly profit mostly the idea to the stories told us by the marketplace which is if we acquire this thing we will be happy and he says, suffering, says our commentator, is false. It's false suffering. It's empty from the start because the things that the suffering impinges on are only this process that we take as real and we cling to it and suffering arises. And over and over, one thing leads to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And it happens so fast that if you're not still and calm, you don't notice it's going on, but it's happening. Perfect, perfect analogy. Right this minute, my image and my voice and my stories are coming out over the waves because of zeros and ones. Computer code is all zeros and ones. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. There is eight bit code and it's done so cleverly that you get the image of my face, my voice, my gestures, and my banjos. That comes across reliably because of the way zeros and ones combine in a computer. How clever. Right? So, but it's still just zeros and ones. And we don't know that. We wait for the signal to be strong enough that our, you know, it, it flows along nicely. We like it. And they're constantly improving on it. And yet, the zeros and the ones are way out at the end of our senses. They're not real. It's just zeros and ones in computer code. And yet we take it as real. That's a perfect uh, analogy for what the Buddha is describing as what's going on in, in, our, uh, in, our, in our original fundamental computer. And it's inverted. 
It says we got the wrong direction. If we turn around and look back, we discover, oh, I'm rich. Nothing that I can get is going to make me feel better than appreciating and recognizing what I fundamentally already have. But who believes that? <laughs> I got to get Taylor Swift's latest reprise of her album. Then I'm happy. Yes, indeed. All righty. Well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about something that's going to happen, which is for friends in Singapore, there is uh, an event coming up. It's right here. The Buddhist Union for Jinghui in Singapore is sponsoring an online conference. Here it is. The path to happiness. <laughs> Not always. The path to wisdom, we would hope. Coming up this time, next week, save a day. Next Saturday, from 9 p.m. to 6 p.m., you can watch live. Uh, here it is. Um, this is a Facebook page. I will put it, I'll put it in the chat box and maybe Jerry can share it with people on YouTube. There it is. Okay, that's a Facebook page. And as you can see, there are many, many, many speakers. I'm one of them. I'll be, you can see there, one, two, there are nine. Nine big shoes. Uh, didn't find it. No, there are seven big shoes and two lay people. Talking about such things as morality, concentration, and wisdom, jading way. Karma and its purification, we're talking about that. Healing in Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana perspectives, practicing the Dharma in the 21st century, and the path to happiness. The, uh, here's the program, if you go down to the Buddhist Union page. These speakers are distinguished Sangha members of, of years, years of practice. Uh, uh, Venerable Master Guangming, uh, Guangping, Guangping from Singapore, uh, Bhante Mahinda, our Dharma friend, is appearing and Venerable Kai Chung, lots of big shoes and some distinguished lay people. So that's going to happen. And uh, that's next Saturday, so you can register and tune in. Um, another thing that's happening is I have a lecture series on here in Australia, in, in this hemisphere, it's Saturday morning. Uh, in California, it's Friday noon. 1230. It was originally aimed at Europe. That's why we have this funny time, because our Dharma friends in Poland and Holland, England, France, ask for, in Belgium, ask for a chance to hear the Dharma more regularly. So we've been lecturing on lots of different texts. We have just now finished our series on Guan Yin Bodhisattva and the Pumanpin, the Universal Gateway, and how to access Guan Yin through practices. We've uh, just finished that. We've got one, one concluding lecture coming up. Following that, we're going to be talking about the Zheng Dao Ge, Song of Enlightenment, Yong Jia Da Shi Zheng Dao Ge. Um, one of the joys of the Song of Enlightenment is we have Shi Fu, Master Hua, uh, reciting it. And it's sublime. He says, and uh, we've translated it in English and we sing it. So we'll be talking about it because the Song of Enlightenment, Zheng Dao is the enlightened mind in language. You know as you're reciting the Song of Enlightenment that Master Yong Jia, a Tang Dynasty monk, uh, had already seen through the illusion. 
he was not like our lorikeet here on the screen. He was no longer inverted. He was right side up. He had seen through it and put it down. So it's just a wonderful piece of literature. And uh, Master Hua said, any day that we are able to recite the Zheng Dao Go from memory is a day when we will have no affliction. It has the power, when you recite it from memory, of banishing your troubles, chasing your blues away. And it is a, it's a song. It's a gu. It's not a sutra. It's not a shastra. It's not a praise. It's a gu. It's to be sung. So, uh, let's see. Um, 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 I won't try to, f I won't fake it. I'll give it to you for real next time. So, we've actually uh, recorded it. Uh, one some some of the verses it's 63 verses long so you don't do it <laughs> you know, it's never going to make it to the top 40 because it takes hours but we can still um, still sing it and one of the joys of my life people who know country and western and bluegrass music in America know the name of Peter Rowan and uh, you should know the name of Jody Stecker if you don't know it so Jody and Peter were in the kitchen at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And I said, I got this wonderful, wonderful tune, wonderful Buddhist song. We've got to put it into music. We've got to get a tune for it. And they together said, what about the blind fiddler? That'll work. So Peter Rowan and Jody Stecker uh, nominated the Brian Fiddler. And Once you get the root, you can let the branch tips be. Like a jeweled moon that shines in lapis lazuli. Now that you have understood this wish-fulfilling gem, benefits to self and others truly never ends so we see three verses and we're we don't have it all we got like 58 down the yeah, there's a, a handful that are still kind of hard to fit into the meter but so not this coming saturday we're still got one more guanyin lecture to do we're going to wrap it all up and transfer the merit sing some Guanyin Bodhisattva songs. But then following that, we have the Zheng Dao Ge and uh, Master Hua um, explained uh, the, Zheng, the Song of Enlightenment and dedicated, before he began it, this is one of the early, in the early years of his time in America, before he began, he made a verse of dedication. It's very moving. So we'll start with investigating what Shifu said about the Zheng Dao Ge and then... Uh, Lots of talk about Chan and encouragement to meditate ourselves so that we too can realize the Tao. Okay, previews of coming attractions. All right, uh, I don't know whether Berkeley Monastery is online. I see, oh, they are. Uh, Jin Chuan Shi, are you or Jin Wei Shi there to tell us what's going on? Yeah, you can do that. And the Berkeley website, I just added a few activities. Oh. That are coming up. Oh, uh, hold on here. Okay, Berkeley Monastery. Get there in just a moment. There we go. Just loading so, slowly. There we go. Okay. So coming up, starting tomorrow, will be a um, Emperor of the Young Repentance at Gold Sage Monastery. They do this every year during the Thanksgiving break, and they've requested the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery monks to help transmit the eight precepts. And so we will be doing that on, on Monday, November 22nd, 8 a.m., followed by a talk going to about 10 a.m. in the morning. And we're using the Gold Sage link, so you can find the Zoom ID there and the mm -hmm. uh, passcode. I realized that it should be eight precepts. I'll correct that right after this. And then the next thing below is, a, sorry, not showing a week long. It should be a three-day Amitabha session. Uh -huh. Let me just quickly change that. So we will be doing that December 
Ching Forsh would like to do a three-day Amitabha session from December 4th to December 6th. So if people are interested in joining that, you find all the information there. It's the same format we've been doing in the past. We found works quite well for our kind of um, uh, online programs. Other than that, we just have a regular schedule. Um, you'll see we kept some recordings online for those who just want to be able to access our recordings at any time for our BBM online daily activities. But um, that's pretty much it. Okay, I want to add here, there's a lot of bells and whistles for these um, Amitabha sessions. It, uh, Jin, Jin Chuan sure corrected himself, it's, it's three days here, it's not a week long, but it's a three-day session from December 4th to the 6th. And you register if you want to join on Zoom, which gives you a lot more functions. Uh, you can also watch it on YouTube, which is more uh, less active, more passive. But at the beginning, there is a transmission of the eight precepts, and Yes. We've got a lot of, you can read them. P, there's a PDF you can download here. Further, um, the uh, the ceremonies that happen during the three days are here online. Amitabha praise, dedication of merit. Uh, the transferences are there so that you can join in. You can really do it at home right along with the monks. And should you decide you want to set up uh, a, a, a Pai Wei, a memorial plaque, here's how to do it. Our people can do two, right. Yeah, we, were, we asked people if they can do two if they participate. They don't have to participate in all of it, but if you just participate even in just one session, then we're happy to help have you help you set up two pie ways. Okay. So that's, uh, we're in fact taking advantage of the pandemic forced uh, online presence to, to offer some things that people couldn't do before. Uh, or didn't know about. So this is the silver lining of being in a lockdown that gave us, gave rise to this online presence. So a lot going on in a three-day uh, Amitabha session. Eightfold precepts, uh, participating actively on Zoom or passively on, on YouTube, uh, learning the ceremonies, sharing the ceremonies, putting up two memorial plaques. Oh, I should also just... Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I should also say uh, Dharma Master Jing Fu just spoke with me that he will not be doing his Thursday Sutra lecture on Thanksgiving. He first thought he would, but then I think he thought about it and said, actually, it'd be probably good if people have a Thanksgiving evening with their families. So we will mm -hmm. not have a Sutra lecture on Thursday. Okay. Ben, here in Australia, there's no Thanksgiving happening. Yeah. It, in Australia, it doesn't <laughs> no. So, Sacagawea. Yeah. And... Uh, Right. Um, my dear friend, Doug George Canantillo, a Mohawk uh, chief and spokesperson and journalist, uh, every year writes and says, uh, if people want to be mindful as they go through Thanksgiving, he said, we as as Native Americans uh, would encourage everybody to look into um, ending domestic violence. He said this is uh, a plague that is uh, not only is a problem on Thanksgiving, but it's a problem year round. And this will be, you know, go ahead and, and enjoy your meal. But after the meal and after the drinks and after the football, uh, really find a way to put an end to people harming other people. He said, this is, this is what the great spirit would move us to do. We should be better, become better humans, he said. So I really admire that, and, and uh, that's on the ground, not in the clouds. And it really sets the story straight, you know, the idea that uh, the natives welcomed the white folks with corn and squash and beans and that was where thanksgiving that was the end of the story well that may have the generosity of the red peoples to the white peoples is legendary but um regardless of the color of your skin uh, we need to be kind to each other especially to the people who gave birth to us the women in our lives okay so happy thanksgiving everyone
let us transfer the merit through the mantra from Medicine Buddha, sending out all of the good wishes that we'd like to bring harmony to our bodies and to the world. Here we go. times. I'd like you to join me if you care to. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Okay, that's all from us for today. Be well, be safe. See you all next week. Amit Kofu.